what what are we going to do today we are going to see properties of this fourier expansion let's see how but again when we look at these properties you have to remember that we we, we are looking at these functions these functions can also be viewed as a vector in r to the power 2 to the power n there is a fourier coefficient there are parities parities form an orthonormal basis all these kind of things you would want to remember okay before we go into the properties but if you want to calculate a fourier uh, a fourier expansion of a function first thing is to calculate fourier co coefficients question is how will you calculate f at x think of it algorithmically whatever uh, i give you a function uh, i give you a subset s and i ask you what is the value of f at x how would you do it or how did you do it yesterday and function not all equal function whatever i i you pick a function i give you the function this function does this or i give you the truth table of the function and then i ask what is f at s by expanding the formula yeah. good so, yeah. uh -huh. uh, by expanding the formula means you will write it in this indicator basis right this identity a yes yes yeah Right, f is equal to summation a f a indicator a x kind of a thing, right? Uh, good. That is the way, and this is how we figured out the Fourier expansion of L, right? Yesterday. The thing is, though, this might. So one thing uh, over here. Can we look at? I mean, as uh, yesterday also, you. Uh, uh, I mean, focused on this point. So that this polynomial representation, though we are restricting it to the domain minus one comma one, yet we can also view it as the entire real numbers, right? You mean the domain as entire real numbers or range as real numbers? I mean, even the I mean, uh, even if we look at from perspective, yet it is valid. You mean, mean in the in the input also, I can put put a real number that is correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so are you asking is that is that valid to view it as a polynomial in r to the power n uh, yeah 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 i yes. wanted to yes so uh, formally in in mathematics if i want to write it my function is of this form my polynomial is of this form and when does p represent f p represents f if and only if px is equal to fx for all x in the interest table sounds good but the polynomial exists as a polynomial from r to the power n to r yeah. uh, so then in that case uh, mm -hmm. in order to find the fourier coefficients mm -hmm. uh, can't we i mean uh, uh, i mean if we want to find the fourier coefficient corresponding to a set s mm -hmm. yeah so for those monomials we put it we, we substitute one but for the rest of them we substitute zero how do you do that what is the input uh, which makes you are in a minus 1 comma 1 frame right so what yeah. is the input which will make just one monomial of that s one and rest zero i mean uh, say supposing uh, for for a particular index set s uh, uh all the values uh, corresponding to uh, corresponding to that index set we substitute them as one while for uh, no no it won't work right it is the problem is the domain is 1 comma minus 1 right mm -hmm. right so uh, yeah so uh, by the way this is why i always uh, emphasize upon upon the uniqueness right if you look at this uh, characterization that p represents f if px is equal to fx at all x of the interesting domain and it is not really clear that there is only one p which represents it but we know that if we restrict p to be multilinear
then there is a unique P which represents it, right? This we will look at. Just wanted to clarify this. Yeah, sorry. Uh, now coming back to the main question, right? Uh, we were talking about F at S and uh, yeah, but the point is that the way you are describing it is kind of very expensive, right? You write it, you look at the entire two table, you multiply everything out. And then in some sense, when you multiply everything out, it seems to be expensive because not just for S, you will get F at S for every S, right? Is there a quicker way to find F at S? Taking an inner product, I mean, uh, just how we, uh, we, we present F as a function in R2 and we can uh, and as we already know that all those chi are basically orthonormal basis uh, vectors so very then, good. yes so you know vector uh, if you want to find one particular component we just in a product it with the with that component which has one there and rest zeros so exactly. Exactly. yeah we would in a product it, right. right so if i told you that v was equal to summation alpha i vi where vi is form an orthonormal basis. What will be alpha? I? It will be the inner product of VI. Right. And now we know in this space, R to the power to the power N, which we know has a nice inner product, F is equal to chi S. Right? F is a vector which is represented in terms of orthonormal basis of chi s. That tells me f at s is equal to chi s. f inner product chi s. Yeah, inner f inner product chi s or chi s inner product f, whatever way you want to write it. This is equal to what is this equal to? How did we define the inner product? 1 over 2 to the power n into summation over all inputs of chi s x times f x. Very good. So this is the average value of f multiplied by chi s. Correct? You have to do the power In what n. Sense are you saying it's an average value? It is oh, one, okay, okay. 1 by 2 to the power n. Okay, got it. Okay. Uh, oh, that, that reminds me. Uh, how, how are things uh, with probability? Do people understand what random variables are, expectation and everything? What is an expectation? What is an expectation of a random variable? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, we will take, uh, we will go into some of those today. If you feel uncomfortable after, if, about these things, please talk to me after the lecture in the same call and I will give you some resources to Okay, but uh, finally, your your idea of what probability distributions are, what random variables are, should be clear. Okay, uh, okay good. So we have a form for f at s, right? So let's take a an example to make it clear. Let's calculate the coefficient of x1 in the expansion of n. Sounds good. That means I am asking f at f, f at of with set. Just one. Just one, just one right? And for the ease of representation, sometimes I will just write it like it should be written as a set, but when I'm, I'm feeling lazy, I will write it like this. And now, what is that? By our, uh, by our formula. Let's calculate it. 1 by 4, correct? This is 1 by 2 to the power n. And then, uh, let's take input 1 comma 1. Right? What is f on input 1 comma 1? 1. And what is chi s on 1 comma 1? 
chi chi s of x1 uh, sorry chi s of 1 comma 1 okay one is just right now now let's take the input 1 comma minus what is f uh, one what is uh, chi s one again one right because x1 is one my chi s of x is just x1 what about input minus 1 comma 1 f is 1 chi s is minus 1 good and the last case when it is minus 1 comma minus 1 f is minus 1 and chi s is sorry chi s is Minus, minus, one. minus one, right? Minus. Then what will happen? We will get, and if you remember from yesterday, this is the correct. Answer. And you can do it for all the. Equations. This we will remember, right? Uh, this is this is this is a very very important point. You should remember. This is how we calculate Fourier transform, and will prove properties also. Many a times we will use properties. By using this form. Great. We now know how to calculate Fourier coefficient. Another thing which you noticed here is that what was Fourier expansion in terms of linear algebra? Fourier expansion in terms of linear algebra. Linear algebra matrices, vectors, and all those things. We used to look at them. In that language, what is Fourier expansion? Uh, a change of basis, or you will transformation. Good. Very good. It's a unitary transformation, which is achieving a change of basis. What are the two bases? So, here one is the standard basis, and the other is the orthogonal basis of parities. Very good. One is the standard basis, where standard basis means this. One zero 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 one zero 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 one. This was the standard basis, and then the the basis in which we are changing is the Fourier basis, or basis of vectors. Right. So one vector will correspond to chi s phi, which is all ones. Then chi s of x one, one 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 minus one minus one minus one, and so. Sorry, chi. So I should say chi phi of x, chi x one of x. Right. This. Uh, uh, this is clear, right? These are my two bases, and I am doing a change of bases. Right. This is what what I did. I wrote my f in terms of this new orthonormal basis. That basically means that if if you are given f in the standard basis, this is equal to some matrix, or uh, yeah, sorry, let's say. This is the Fourier basis. I want the things in Fourier basis. I will take the f in standard basis, multiply it with some some things here, and I will get the coefficients in the Fourier. Basis, right? This is what uh, remember basis change. Uh, uh, if I wanted to do a basis change, then my v prime used to be b v, where b was the matrix of basis change. Now, knowing this, what is going to be this matrix? This is called the Fourier transform matrix. What are going to be the rows of the Fourier transform? So here, V is the standard uh, in standard basis, and V prime yes. is the is in Fourier basis. Correct. Uh, columns of this matrix would be the uh, 
uh, I mean the Fourier transform representation of the standard uh, basis vectors. Okay, okay, good. But uh, you can actually guess it uh, from that formula also. You are telling me columns, but actually rows are easier to understand. I will leave it as an exercise. What is this basis change? Okay, so you can fill here it. in this in this case uh, since the matrix would have real entries also only, mm -hmm. so that's why uh, it's it's simply its transpose would be its inverse side. So that's why the rows are columns of the other. Uh, basis chain. That's why they are easier to understand. Uh, sorry, you said the inverse will be what? Uh, this is a unitary matrix side, and here yeah, the elements. Yes, yes. And the elements we are considering would be all reals. So yes. that means its transpose would be. It will be basically an orthogonal matrix. Correct. So, so and likewise, how I said that columns. So the rows here would be the column of the transpose matrix and. That is the inverse yes. transformation. So yes, you can figure out that exactly, right? Uh, so you are not not confused about how to figure the entries, right? Mm -hmm. You can uh, you can figure out what this entry is. There will be an S here. This is how you should index it. The columns are indexed by inputs. This is indexed by subsets. The rows are indexed by subsets, and you want to tell me uh, what this is. You want to figure out this entry. That is the exercise. Okay, you should be able to. So the columns are indexed by inputs. There are two to the power n inputs, right? Yes, yes. So those are the the inputs. The columns are indexed by inputs. Okay. So, so what's the two, rational behind this type of indexing? Uh, oh, like because. It. Because look at the standard basis, right? In the standard basis, how are you indexing your coordinates? It is f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, and so on. Yes. This will be f of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. This will be f of minus 1, minus 1. Okay, so uh, the rows will be basically the values of chi s x laid out. Again, it's an exercise, so don't tell me. Let other, other people do it. Okay. It's a small exercise, but you can fit. You, you have got it, right? So this is easy. Okay, great. Now we figured out Fourier basis is a basis change. Matrix. That is great. But then why are we worried about just one basis? There are so many orthogonal basis of R to the power, 2 to the power. N. Why are we only talking about Fourier basis? Somehow the Fourier basis should be special, right? If it wasn't special, then I can take any other orthogonal basis. There are so many orthogonal basis of R to the power, 2 to the power n. Any ideas? Any guesses? No. Okay. So uh, I said that I can view f as a function in r to the power to the power n. That's a good representation. But the thing is that it is missing out on a lot of things. What is it missing out? It is missing out on this fact that your domain is structured. Right? Or other way to say it is that your domain is z2 to the power. You take any f whose uh, any f going from s to r, where the size of the set is to the power n. Then the function can be represented as r to the power 2 to the power n. Right? That's the only thing which we used when we said that f is, is element of r to the power 2 to the power n. That's just because the size of minus 1 comma 1 to the power n is to the power. That's the only thing we need. 
but minus one comma one to the power n has a structure, right? These the entries there are elements of a group. That is why, uh, if if we choose a basis where this group property is used somehow, then that basis will be important. Now, how it will be important, you will see it throughout the course. But that is the intuition. And if you check, all the parities satisfy this nice condition. Right? It is easy to verify. In in other sense, this parity. Is a homomorphism over the group z two to the power. That makes it a special basis. So not just that we are coming up with the basis of r to the power two to the power n, but every element is a homomorphism on z two to the power n on the group. That makes this basis very very special. So. Uh... In this homomorphism, x and y are uh, they are elements of the group z two to the power n. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So okay, so the operation of that group is the Zor operation, right? Oh, uh, you can view it as minus one comma one, no? and then multiplication will be the operation. Oh. Okay. Right. So here, since I'm talking about minus okay. one comma one, I will multiplication. Right. Right. So. I am just trying to give you some intuition of why this basis is going to be special, and you will see the consequences a lot of times in in future. So, but 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 that is why Fourier basis is special. It, it relates to the group structure, and that is why it is actually called the Fourier transformation. Could you repeat the homo homomorphism? Uh, sure. Like that so, statement. Yeah. Right. So what I am saying is that. If if you look at this space, right? This space has many bases, but the particular Fourier basis. If you look at any any element of this basis, it's actually a homomorphism over the group z to the power because of this equation. Right. So so then okay. this is kind of saying that my domain has this nice structure of z to the power. And it is capturing it in in some sense. If my function was just from some s to r, where s was to the power n, then this property might not be satisfied. Then this Fourier basis will not be important for those functions. For that set, multiplication might not be defined. Right. So uh, this is this is uh, some intuition of why this Fourier basis is. Special. Did I answer your question? Yeah, the second part I did not get. So, if a function is from some set S to R, uh, right? Then, then the these KISs might not be special for such a such functions. Then it will only be an orthonormal basis. It will be an orthonormal basis for all functions of this kind. Okay. So the right. specialty is because it, the range is minus one comma one two or z two n. The domain is z to the power n. Yeah. And for that, the ISs are homomorphic. Okay. Right. Okay. Just a small question. So, had we originally chosen our, uh, had we originally chosen our domain to be zero comma one to the power n instead of minus one comma one to the power n. Then, uh, then we still would have got some sort of. We still would have written a function uh, in the uh, in the form of the polynomial, okay. some as, uh, some as by as, right? Summation of as. So, uh, would that not be special? Would that not be something like a Fourier transform? Uh, no, this will not be called a Fourier transform because these functions, right? right. These. Are not characters of z two to the power. Okay. In zero comma one two, there the characters would be these. Okay. Uh, actually, to be more precise, minus one to the power. These would be the characters. Okay. So 
then in the zero comma one, this is not called the Fourier transform. We will not call it the Fourier transform. Only in minus one comma one domain we'll call it the Fourier transform. Cool. The uh, we now know the Fourier expansion, and it is special. Now with this basis chain interpretation. We will see lot of nice properties of Fourier transform. The first property is going to be called Planck-Schrödinger scale. What does it say? Given any two functions f comma g, again in our favorite form. Their inner product can be written in terms of the Fourier transform. Can you give Can you give me a like a one line proof for this? Why should this be true? Because the basis just write f and g in their Fourier transform. Forms and then multiply. So only the so the all the cross products, uh, as and B, uh, as and bt they would cancel out because they're all that, that's different. not one line. Sorry, Your unitary is, uh, unitary operators basically preserve the inner product. So because yes, that... yes, uh, length of a vector is invariant invariant under Basis sheet. Right? Do you agree? Do you agree with this statement that length of the vector under a unitary basis change? If, what is a unitary basis change in in R? It's kind of a rotation. Right. So if I if I rotate. My vectors can that can that change the length of a vector? Yes, no? no, no, obviously no, right? So that is the idea. That is uh, other way to say it. You might you must have seen it in in many ways. Look at f. Look at g. How wh what do you do with the inner product? You take these entries, multiply them, and then add all the coordinates. Now there is this Fourier basis. They will look like you multiply the entries and then add, and the inner product should not change, or the length should not change. Sorry, I shouldn't say. Actually, the person was right. I should not have said length, but I should have said inner product or the angle between the vectors. Inner product specifies the angle between these two vectors, right? And that angle does not change. Then you do a unitary basis change, right? So there is a small technicality, right? Do you remember the technicality? Why is this not a complete proof? How did we define f comma uh, Inner product of so, f and g. So, if one of the vectors is zero, then uh, the angle isn't exactly defined. No, no, no. It is. Although the inner product will still be defined. Okay. Inner product will still be. No, you remember how we defined the inner product of f and g? It was not our usual inner product in R, right? So we summed up over all the values. So... Right, right, and then one over two to the power n. There was a one over two to the power n at the normalized it. Right, and that might make things weird. So let let's do the calculation. And make sure that this is okay. Right. Let us say f and g are f x. So f x here, g x here. Right. And when we change to the Fourier transform, in the if if my inner product was the usual inner product, right. If my inner product I had defined it as summation f x g x, then what will be the norm of parity?
uh, the length square between two to the power n, right? Mm, yes. So right. That that is that is why we divided by one by two to the power n to make it a unit term. Correct. But other way to say it is that. Uh, So now summation f at s chi s x, right? I am writing it in terms of vectors, but these vectors are not orthonormal in the usual inner product. So in the usual inner product, if I want to make them orthonormal, I should just divide them by square root to the power n. That's okay. That doesn't change things. Right? Uh, this will still. So now in the usual inner product, these things are orthonormal. That means if I do inner product in one side, this will be equal to inner product on the other side with these. Being the coefficient, right? Other way to say it is, I had my f vector f x when I converted into Fourier basis, and if I kept my usual inner product, then my entries would look like. And then, if I take the dot product on both sides, it should be equal. This is saying that summation f x g x should be equal to summation over s multiplied this and this. I can collect this and bring it here. This is what we call Planck-Schrödinger's, so, right? This is okay. so even in the usual inner product. If you want to go to the usual inner product, you can verify Planck-Schrödinger's. What is the idea? The length or the inner product between vectors do not change when we do a basis change. You might see many proofs of Planck-Schrödinger's theorem. You, it might seem like magic. It is not. The simple idea behind behind Planck-Schrödinger's theorem is one of you already said: inner product does not change with change of basis with unitary. We are fine with Planck-Schrödinger's theorem now. Any questions about this proof? Everyone is okay. Everyone is sleeping. No. No. Okay. 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 Yeah. Should I repeat it? Should I? That's fine. Sorry, yeah. it's fine. It's it's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, vote anyone uh, who wants uh, who is not clear about this argument. Raise your hand. Okay. Good. Now we have uh, Planck-Schrödinger theorem, and one simple substitution gives us. What we call Parseval's theorem. What is the substitution? F equal to G. When F is equal to G, what would be Planck-Schrödinger's theorem statement? 
This is equal to sum of the squares of the proportion. Sum over x. What is this quantity? This is one over two to the power n. Length of f the norm. F of c. Yes. Remember now in our new inner product where we are dividing by one by two to the power n, this is going to be the length. Okay. Since our inner product has changed now, this is what we call as the length of the vector. This is called Parseval's theorem. And if f is Boolean, then Then what do we get? That is one. This is one. Right? This is in some sense the first uh, special property of Boolean functions you see. Right? So We were doing everything when the range was real. The statement three is very, very important that the sum of square of Fourier coefficients is equal to one. This is true when f is good. And this will be used so many times. This simple statement, I can't tell you how many times you are going to use in the field of analysis of Fourier. So up till now we are not just studying Boolean functions, but we are in general studying functions with range R, uh, poly polynomials with range R with uh, not uh, polynomials, with multi linear polynomials. Uh, functions whose ranges R, which can be represented by multi. Multi linear. Right. So all these statements are about functions of this. Kind. They have a polynomial representation that gives rise to f at s. That's a different. But the statements are about the function. Okay. Right. And now when you restrict r to be minus 1, comma 1, then suddenly you get this very nice thing, which we call the Parseval's theorem. Many a times when people say Parseval's theorem, they would call 3 as Parseval's theorem instead of 3 prime or something. But it shouldn't confuse you. It is saying that the length of the vector does not change under this situation. Proof of Parseval's theorem. Length of the vector does not change. Whenever someone says F is Boolean, this, you should start using this for sure. This is the first thing which should come to your mind. Oh, F is Boolean and you want to use Fourier analysis, then you should say, oh, their Fourier coefficients will sum up to you. That's the first thing. Then we'll move about doing other things. Uh, so what's the, uh, what's the specialty of that word unitary for that basis change? So, oh, that basically means it's an orthonormal basis and not just any linearly independent. Okay. Uh, basis change you can define even when there is a linearly independent, right? So, but but that would not preserve length or inner products. You need to have an orthonormal basis. Generally, I don't know if you have studied in 11, 12, probably all the basis changes were orthonormal basis changes. I don't know how, uh, but generally in college when they talk about it, they also specify that you can do basis change with respect to linearly independent. They need not be orthogonal. Right? So. Okay. So, now, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uniform probability distribution. I'm going to talk about a slightly different language in terms of probability and expectation. And we are going to see many of these results in terms of that language. It will help us to put our results 
in the language of probability and expectation. If you are thinking of uh, thinking of the fact that oh there is too much mathematics why we are doing this don't worry be patient we are going to see lot of applications next week whatever we have done this week I will show you applications of it the next whole next week will be devoted to showing you expectations this small bit of mathematics which you are doing uh, just two classes that in itself give very nice properties for a computer we will see these applications okay. At this point, just try to guess uh, to, to get the mathematical beauty of this representation. Like we have such a representation. Why is it important? You will see very soon. Okay. Yeah. So why? Uh, so what do I mean by language of probability and expectation? Uh, whenever I talk about probability, I should have a probability distribution in mind. It will change, but the most natural probability distribution over inputs would be. Mm, that's not the most the simplest. Okay, let, let me not say natural, the simplest. Uniform distribution. Right, uniform probability distribution. That means whenever I write probability, some event, that means this probability is taken over uniform distribution. On that means every x is chosen with probability 1 by 2 to the power. I will write expectation over x something or even if I am not writing anything, this expectation means every uh, input, uh, let's say some random variable y, then this is uh, 1 by 2 to the power n y at x. Right? This is the probability of choosing x and this is the value of the random variable. Is there anyone who is not familiar with expectation? Okay, good. If you are not, if you if, if these things are not uh, okay, I see that some people have raised hands. So uh, let's uh, let's talk after the class. I will give you some reading material so that you can you know uh, you can get familiar with these concepts of probability. But but it it will probably take you 30, 40, 1 hour. But but this is very very important. Not just for this course, you should know it as a computer scientist. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is the expectation. Let's let's put whatever we have learned in terms of probability and expectation, right? First thing is, what is the expectation of this quantity? One if s equals pi, otherwise zero. Very good. This is one if s is equal to phi. Why? Because what is this? This is one by two to the power n summation over x chi is this. This is the average of, yeah, actually, uh, by the way, for today's lecture, people who don't know about expectation, who are not very familiar with expectation, just think of it as an average over all the input inputs. We are just taking an average, that's all. So if I want to take this average, we saw yesterday that it is one if s is equal to phi and zero otherwise. Right? So this gives me expectation of phi s. Good. Next. What is this in terms of Fourier coefficients? I want to write it in terms of fx, fx, s's, right? This e of fx. What is that? Mm. 
1 by 2 to the power n times f x phi 1 by 2 to the power n times summation f x right this uh, uh, what you uh, did was uh, had a small problem with the normalization but what i have written you can't argue that's the definition of expectation correct yes yes because fx i can i can change it to fx times 1 which is chi phi of x correct this is the trivial parity If 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 there are no variables, then then chi phi of x is just all ones, right? And then this is f x bar. No one is uh, people are not confused what chi phi x is, right? Okay, good. So this gives me f x phi. there is another way of doing this thing which utilizes another very very fundamental principle which i call linearity of expectation this is equal to expectation now i will just open it in terms of the fourier representation and then by linearity of expectation that means i can take the expectation inside this formula again this is a very very simple result this 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 requires probably three lines of proof but the places where i have used linearity of expectation i can't count every second or third day in my research i apply this linearity of expectation so something which should be clear to you the it is so useful precisely because it does not require any assumption on the probability distribution nothing about independence nothing about probability assumptions being nice expectation is always linear and this tells me this becomes summation f at s expectation of phi x correct this is just by linearity i i i'm just taking my expectation to be inside expectation of a plus b is equal to expectation of a plus expectation This is linearity of expectation, and this is what I get. Now this is zero, except when s is equal to five. This gives me f. This is another proof that expectation of f x is f x. Okay. I think we can actually generalize it by writing expectation of phi x into f. I think that will be a factor. Uh, sorry, expectation of phi x into f. Phi x into f. Uh, you want to do this? Yeah, it will. I think it, it, this is going to be f at s, right? This is f at s. Yes. Okay, so I guess this is a small generalization of that effect type. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so we can write it as a theorem. Nice. Thank you. We can also say that this quantity is equal to f at s. When you take s is equal to phi. that will give you the previous statement which said that expectation of fx is f thank you yeah this is a more general statement and the proof is exactly the same okay uh, you just multiply fx with chi sx everywhere remember what happens when you multiply two parities and then apply linearity of expectation right so uh, you can you can do the proof yourself remember yesterday also we when we multiply two uh, parities what happens to that and then apply linearity of expectation you will get this okay what about this what is this the inner product 
exactly this is the inner product between f and g which is equal to inner product of the fourier coefficient summation okay. right this is another way to write planck schrodinger this is there is another way to write planck schrodinger uh, nothing there is nothing deep about it you already saw planck schrodinger theorem that said that the inner product between two vectors does not change in the language of expectation it looks like this. we change it to f is equal to g it becomes expectation of fx square is equal to anyone except udit what is this going to be one if f is boolean right oh, f is f boolean so yeah. this quantity and this f will be one, one. this is one. F, f is one. correct this is partial i'm not doing anything special i'm just writing everything in the language of quadi right now what can i say about variance of uh i will let you uh, guys uh, take 4 5 minutes tell me what is the value of this in terms of the fourier coefficient uh let me help you here what is variance it is expectation of fx minus e of f whole square so what this whatever is come out to be 1 minus f at 5 uh yeah yeah don't assume f to be boolean oh okay and don't look at my notes do the calculation yourself yeah i did myself okay but uh, but uh, you uh, you said don't as you have to boolean but when we are talking about very uh, variance we are just talking about the uh, or or you know probability distribution right so just for the purpose of no i might be yeah uh, I, I, i might be Uh, there is some disturbance yeah now it is yeah uh, it might be a uniform probability distribution but why should a value of f be 1 or minus 1 yeah got it it should be f hat phi square minus summation f hat square okay uh, yes good so now this is going to be expectation of f x square minus expectation of f uh, whole square is that correct? No. Yeah. Yes. Right. Now uh, this is just by opening it up, right? If you open it up and apply linearity of expectation, you will get this. Uh, are there any doubts about how do I get this? Okay, now what is this quantity? Summation of f hat square. Right, this is partial square. And what is expectation of f square? F hat five square. Exactly. This is something which we saw. Expectation of f is f hat five, so this is f hat five square. This is summation over all s such that s is not five. Right. so we can write many properties of f in terms of fourier basis this is this is a nice transformation this is what uh, we wanted to do and this is the general guideline which will happen throughout the course we will look at some things which will which are given in terms of standard basis and things will not be clear to us but as soon as we put them in the fourier basis nice properties will just be will just split up uh, will just come up 
you will see that uh, very, very nice things can be seen or uh, uh, nice things will spill out as soon as you look at the Fourier equations. For example, suppose you want to say that the function is balanced, right? That means it has equal number of ones and minus ones. If you want to see that in the two table, it is very, very hard. You have to look at every something, sum it up and see whether it is equally, it, it is equal to zero or not. But suppose you are given the Fourier transform of the function. How can you check whether it is balanced or not? Expectation of f should go to zero. I mean, because the sum. Exactly, exactly. So, function is balanced if and only if. What can I say about the Fourier coefficient then? What is expectation of fx? Part five basically. Yes, exactly. It is very easy to check in Fourier basis whether the function is fine. So you just ask what is f, and that will give you whether the function is fine. Right? Uh, balance means equal number of zeros and ones. In equal doubt. number of ones and minus. Ones. Yes. Uh, okay. Ones and minus ones. Okay. And and this is again the similar idea which happens in the real case. You remember. You wanted to say, oh, if the function is uh, if the function is smooth, then the Fourier transform will be peaked. If the if the function is very peaky, then the Fourier transform is smooth, and things like that. Similar things. So there also some properties of real functions was easy to guess in the Fourier domain. Here also many properties of the uh, uh, of the function would be easy to guess if given the Fourier basis. That's all. Now in the remaining time, I will describe an operation which is useful in uh, computer science uh, and Fourier analysis. Uh, I won't be covering an application of it in the next week, probably later. For you, you can take it as, a, as an application of whatever we have learned in, right? So let's define this new function which is called the convolution of f and g. I have two functions f and g. The convolution of f and g is defined to be expectation over y of this point. Okay, remember here, x is fixed and y varies. Y varies over all to the power n values. In some sense, I am asking how much f is related with everything in G. Okay. <coughs> now, knowing this, I want to calculate the Fourier transform of this function. So here, what do you mean by g, g of x, y? So x, y, what is the meaning? See, y, what, what is y? y is a string in minus 1, 1 to the power n. Yes. x is also a string in minus 1, 1 to the power n. Yeah. And we know how we multiply them. We multiply them coordinate by, right? That was true even when I wrote this, this thing. Okay. okay. So this is multiplication in z2 to the power n, if you want to be precise. But simply, you can say that I'm just multiplying them quantities. Yes. The ith place of xy is xi1. So now, uh, what is what is this uh, Fourier coefficient of f star g? How will I find it? What will you do if, if someone says, give me this or, or I will shoot you? In a formula? Yeah, we have a formula for this, right? This is F star G chi S. Right? So this is summation over X, one by two to the power N.
f star g of x by this x, right? This is just by writing out the formula. Do you agree? Now I will write chi s x as it is and expand this. This I know is expectation over y f y g x y. What is expectation over y f y g x y? It is the average, right? So this is 1 by 2 to the power n summation over y f y g x y. It's a simple expectation with a simple probability distribution. This will add, it will become 1 by 2 to the power. This is fine. Questions about this? This is just putting things in place. There will be a summation y also. There is summation of y. Very nice. Good. I just wanted to check if you guys are not asleep. This means you are you are awake. Good. Okay. So uh, yes, uh, my mistake. Y will be there. Now this is the formula. But uh, how how should we do it? We want to we wanted to convert this into Fourier coefficients of f and Fourier coefficient of g. But for f y we need chi s y. And for gxy, we need chi s of xy, right? Then only we will get some sort of Fourier coefficients. But we have chi s x. What can we do? Write f and g in their Fourier representation. Uh, things might become more messy with that. Instead, can I split it in terms of chi s of y and chi s of x y? What is chi s of x in terms of chi s of y and chi s of x y? Chi s x y over chi s y. Is this okay? Because chi s of y whole square is equal to one, right? Oh, right. So I can, instead of dividing, I can multiply. Right? And then I can pair them up. Okay? So let me just write what I get. 1 by 2 to the power n summation over xy f of y chi s of y g of xy chi s of xy. Are we on the same page? You agree? I haven't cheated. Have I cheated? No. Uh, yeah, I also thought so, but yeah, now I have not cheated, right? 1 by 2 to the power 2. Right? Yes. Now, Uh, what can I say about this thing? See, why is fixed now, right? If y is fixed and x goes over all the inputs, what happens to xy? What values will xy take? All the values. Correct. Y is fixed. X goes over everything. This implies xy goes over everything. You can easily check this, right? Uh, basically, what I'm saying is that x1, y cannot be equal to x2, y if x1 is not equal to x2, right? Very, very simple to check. But anyway, so now we know this, then what is this quantity? 
g hat of s uh, yes g hat of s multiplied by uh, opposite power n yes so then one uh, one this uh, one power of 2 will be removed and i will get g hat fine now i can take gs to be outside and what is this quantity now no oh, sorry what is this come on quickly f at s right so we get gs at multiplied by s and this is why convolution is nice because in fourier basis the fourier coefficients are just getting multiplied it might look like a complicated function in the standard basis but in the fourier basis it's very clear what is at this point just take it as an exercise of what we learned we will see its application later but remember this is called convolution this is useful in fourier analysis okay uh, so we did lot of mathematics we saw some important theorems planck-sorel's theorem parseval's theorem we saw how to write it in terms of x next week we are going to see how to apply these things and get very nice things. we will see application in two domains property testing and error correcting that would be the topic of discussion this is from my side uh, please tell me if you have any